So for chapter seven, we're going to be looking at um, food and agriculture. And then with this one, we're also going to have a separate video focused specifically just on pesticides and kind of how that um, factors into this. And then with that, um, it's also going to go into a little bit of the, the research that I did while I was in grad school. Um, and the, the reason I want to show that is because one, I was focused on um, pesticides and environmental science um, when I was doing that research. But two, it's also going to um, connect to, to this content. It's also going to show kind of how you can set up different experiments in terms of having the, the different controls that it is um, sort of the, the sound science that we talked about a little bit in the, the earlier chapter, uh, chapter one. And then also just so you can get a little bit of an idea of um, what grad school kind of looks like at the end, at least in terms of sort of the, the final presentation that you might make. Uh, obviously, it would look different depending on what type of program you're in, but you can get a little bit of an idea of what that's, um, that's like. Uh, but with food and agriculture, obviously, we're looking at just the, the production of food. And we're trying to think of how we can get the, uh, the, the necessary amount of food to every person on Earth. And that's going to tie in a whole bunch of different factors. So it's going to obviously um, be influenced by exactly how many people um, are on the planet, a number that's continuously growing. Um, but the, the main issue isn't going to be the, the amount of food. It's going to be the, the distribution of it. Um, but as the, the planet does, uh, as the, the population does continue to increase, um, we are going to have additional challenges with the, the food production, and that's going to tie in um, these different environmental factors. So the, the quality of the, the soil that we're growing that food in, the, the quality of the water that we're using to grow those plants, um, the, the agriculture system as a whole, so irrigation, um, using the, the water, uh, pesticides, like I said, we'll focus on individually, um, the, the production and use of fertilizers, um, and a whole bunch of other different uh, sort of factors in there. Uh, and then we'll ultimately finish with uh, GMOs, so just genetically uh, modified organisms, how those are going to help us, uh, how they could potentially help us um, provide enough food for the, the entire population, um, as well as some of the potential drawbacks and uh, issues with them. And then just sustainable farming as a whole, kind of large scale, what can we do to make sure that the, the process of producing this food is going to be something that we can continue on to the future indefinitely. Um, and then with the, the production of food, we have the, the term known as food security. And that's just the ability to obtain food um, on a daily basis. And that's looking at it from two perspectives. So um, obtaining healthy foods, so getting the, the correct amount of nutrition, um, which also then includes the, the correct um, amount. So it's looking at the, the quantity and the, the quality of the, the food that you're consuming. And then like pretty much all of the, the topics we cover in this course, it's going to, to factor in um, societal issues, environmental issues, economic issues, because we're gonna see uh, different regions of the, the planet are gonna be more or less um, food secure. So they're gonna have more or less access to uh, the, the, the necessary food they need. Um, and we're gonna see this because of uh, the ability to, to provide that food, which is gonna include all of these different reasons. So a lot of the times the, the richer portions of the, the, of the planet um, are gonna have um, much more access to the, the food that they need. And we're also gonna see that reducing hunger just overall is going to be an economic growth, um, just because it's going to help improve the the workforce. Essentially, you're going to have uh, more people. You're not going to have as many tired people. You're not going to have as many sick people, um, which is just going to help the economy grow overall. Uh, but with food security, there are just a, a couple different designations of it. So hopefully, everybody would be high food secure, meaning that they have the the, the access to the the food they need, and they have access to nutritious food as well, um, but unfortunately we do see uh, some of these uh, other um, categories uh, quite often. Even in the, the United States, one of the, uh, the, the, the richest country in the world, um, we still see a lot of this and probably a lot more than uh, some people may even realize. Uh, but like I said, ending hunger, um, it's gonna be an, improvement to the, the economy, just because with the improved uh, or ending hunger, we're gonna have improved nutrition so that that workforce is gonna be healthier. They're gonna be less, um, they're gonna be missing less days due to, to sickness. Um, 
we're going to have just a, a larger workforce overall. Um, so it's just going to, for multiple reasons, uh, improve the economy. Um, but then looking at it from instead of the like the adult worker, um, thinking about it from the, the child perspective, if we can end hung hunger, that's going to potentially cut uh, infant mortality by up to 60 percent. Um, just because if we can end hunger, that's going to help give them the, the nutrition they need, as well as the, the mother um, is going to have uh, improved nutrition as well. And then with this, uh, like I said, we often see richer portions of the, the world uh, have more access to food, even on a, a smaller scale in families and just in like different communities. Typically, uh, men are often going to have um, more access to the, the food as well. Um, so that's going to impact uh, pregnant mothers as well. So just ending the, the hunger for multiple reasons is going to help um, protect the, the children, help decrease infant mortality, and that's going to help reduce the, the population growth. Because if you think back to, um, it doesn't happen so much in this country anymore, um, but if you think back to uh, like centuries ago, people working on farms, they were going to have much larger, uh, much larger families just because they were essentially using those children as a, a workforce. But the, the infant mortality rate was higher. So they kind of just had more children just because they uh, unfortunately knew at least a couple of them were likely to die. Uh, so if we can kind of reduce the infant mortality, we're going to reduce the, the, the birth rate as well. So we're going to slow that population growth overall. And then with food distribution, if there's ever a, a case where the, um, and it's a, a large scale shortage of food um, that ultimately leads to, to starvation, that's what we're gonna be looking at in the case of famine. And in some cases, this can be caused by um, droughts or floods. So something that's gonna devastate that area environmentally. And it's gonna be um, essentially just killing all of those crops, just removing the, the food source that way. Um, but a lot of times, and more often what's going to be involved is things like war, um, just some sort of conflict or oppression. Because uh, with war, what can happen is uh, the, the people that live in that area are then going to be displaced. They're no longer going to be able to um, tend that land. They're no longer, no, no longer going to be able to um, produce the crops. But then also at the same time, they're going to be moving somewhere else. So they could be moving to another area um, that is already sort of struggling to produce some food. And now they're going to have even more people there to feed. So it's going to um, sort of just worsen that issue. Uh, and then with these famines, like I said, that's going to often be um, something that takes place. They've noticed, um, and your textbook mentions this a little bit, uh, they've noticed that even in the, the cases of extreme droughts and flood, if there's no sort of um, no sort of outside stressor as well, sort of like a, an armed conflict or some sort of political oppression. The, the people in that area can typically at least sort of maintain and survive, um, but famines often, often are a result of some sort of combination of sort of an environmental issue with the, the sort of political or societal uh, conflict as well. Um, and then with the, the food insecurity, like I said, um, it's gonna vary depending on different parts of the, the globe. Uh, are going to have different levels of access to the, the food. So you can see North America, you can see Europe as well, mostly going to have a pretty good amount of access to food, so much so that they're going to actually be able to export uh, different amounts of food. And then uh, different regions of Asia um, and Africa, South America, are going to be the, the more um, food insecure locations. Um, and then part of that's also going to be due to the, the cropland in these locations are gonna be used for production of resources um, for these more developed locations. And we'll cover that a little bit too. Um, but with the, the, the diets, looking at the, the food production, the reason this is gonna be important is because we need, the, um, we need a sufficient amount of calories. We need a sufficient level of nutrients and vitamins in order to uh, maintain our health. And then currently um, you can see just the, the um, the recommended amount of calories per day, uh, just on average. It's going to vary depending on the, the person, depending on what their um, energy uh, expenditures are that day. Uh, but typically, you'll see just a number around here for the, the, the average um, caloric uh, requirements for a person on a daily basis. Um, but currently, there's about 3 billion. And this number is a couple of years old, so I uh, expect it may even be a little bit higher. Um, but there's 3 billion people on Earth that are suffering from, from some sort of 
um, dietary deficiency, so vitamin, mineral, protein, um, just not getting enough of something. And the, the reason that this is going to be a, um, a negative, you're, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with, is just because it's going to lead to negative health consequences. Um, so it can make you sick, it can make you more likely to get sick. Um, and then in children especially, you're going to see reduced cognitive ability. Um, so they'll often see um, lowered IQ scores, just not performing as well on different uh, different tests and things like that. Um, and as well as just the, the physical growth, they'll often see that's reduced as well if you have one of these uh, types of deficiencies, just because your body's not getting enough of what it needs um, in order to, to grow uh, properly. And then with this, you can see over time, we have had a, a reduction in the, the percentage of um, undernourished people. Uh, but again, you can still see it's uh, not the, the same throughout the world. We've got different places that are going to have much more uh, access to food compared to others. Uh, and then with this malnourishment, what we're also going to see is um, some of the, the diseases uh, that can come into place. Hyperthyroidism, just if you're not getting enough iodine. Uh, what can happen is your, your thyroid is just going to uh, enlarge, essentially, and this is going to have an effect on your metabolism as well. Uh, but you're going to get something like this. You're going to get this big kind of bulge in your neck. You're going to get this goiter. Um, and this has largely been sort of eradicated, at least in the, the developed world, because you'll often see table salt. You'll often see it's iodized. So they, they add iodine to the, the table salt um, because that's what the, the thyroid needs. So the, the, the hyperthyroidism, when the, the thyroid enlarges, that's going to be when you're not getting enough iodine. Um, but since we add iodine to most table salt, uh, that's not really much of a problem anymore in this country. Um, but with the, the mal malnutrition, again, it can be any type of the, the vitamins, minerals that we need, but we're going to see a weakened immune system. So that's why we're going to see um, people that are suffering from some sort of malnutrition are often going to get um, more sick easily. They often kind of just look uh, worn down almost just because their their body's not getting uh, enough energy, not, not getting the, the substances it needs to uh, survive. And then, like I said, in children, um, in addition to kind of the, those physical ailments, we'll also see just the, the development is going to be um, stunted a little bit, both mentally and physically. Uh, but one thing to note globally, um, just in terms of the, the food production and sort of the, the distribution of it, um, is we currently have uh, reached a point where overeating, uh, the, the number of people that are overeating now uh, exceeds the, the, the number of underweight people. Um, and this, you may think, is an example of there's just too much food, and in some cases it may be, um, but this is also going to be an example of sort of food insecurity because with the, the food, food insecurity, the cheaper food, it's gonna be higher calories, it's gonna be lower nutrition though. So if you think about fast food, very chi uh, cheap, very quick and easy, um, but it's very high in calories, but very low in nutrition. So you're getting a lot of the, the calorie intake you need, but you're not getting very much of the, uh, the nutrients and the vitamins and minerals you need. Um, and it's also a, a symptom of food insecurity because the, the healthier food is gonna be more expensive so the, um, the, the poorer communities, poorer people um, are just going to be more likely then to have to go with the, the fast food. And that's going to, again, lead to, to overeating, which just like malnourishment um, is going to lead to other health consequences, um, like I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and then another sort of societal aspect of this is processed foods are just um, marketed much, much more. So if you ever watch TV or um, pretty much anything. Um, you're always going to see different advertisements for, for different things. Um, and those are almost never going to be like those healthy foods. They're always just going to be kind of the, the junk food options, um, which are just always going to be sort of the, the higher calorie, lower nutrition, um, just much cheaper options. Uh, but like I said, it does we do have enough food to actually supply uh, the entire world, but the, the main issue is just the, the distribution of it. Um, but all along with the, the production of it, we wanna consider a couple different things. Um, one is just gonna be the, the amount that we waste 
So uh, I think the, the current estimate is about 30% of all food um, is just discarded either because it spoils in um, while well, shipping, uh, we just discard it after it's uh, cooked, whatever it may be. Um, so we're losing a whole bunch of the, uh, the food that way, food that could feed uh, people in the, 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 the areas of the world that aren't getting enough access to food. Um, but also waste in terms of the, the resources that we're using to produce food. Um, so things, for example, like meat are going to be re very resource intensive. Meaning that they're going to require a lot of resources in order to, to produce them, whereas some other uh, different crops are going to require more water than others. Um, so we're thinking about waste in sort of the, those two different perspectives. Uh, and then similarly, in terms of food production, uh, we have biofuels. So those are going to be fuels that are um, being produced from things like um, soy, corn, palm oil, sugar cane. And this is going to affect the, the food production in a couple different ways. One, it's going to be taking the, the, the cropland that could normally be, normally be used for food, and then it's going to be using that to produce fuel. Uh, but it's also going to affect the, the cost of it in a couple different, it's going to affect the, the cost of the, the crops globally. Um, so like I said, these are always going to have economic issues as well. Um, but with the, the environmental, the, the biofuels, there are some concerns that the amount of energy needed um, to produce and process them is actually greater than the amount of energy that's used uh, or that's provided when they're ultimately used. Um, so with the, the biofuels, there's a couple of different concerns with them. Um, and then alter, uh, in addition to just reducing the, the cropland, uh, we see this occur in uh, a lot of different um, developing countries. What they're going to be doing is switching to growing these crops and using these crops for biofuels, because that's going to be a, um, a more profitable endeavor rather than just using it to produce food. But then that's going to, to worsen the, the food security issue in those areas. And then we also see in some cases, uh, this is also destroying the, um, the ecosystem in some, uh, some locations because they're replacing just the, the natural environment to plant these different, um, these different substances. Um, like I said, uh, waste we can think of in two different perspectives, one from just sort of throwing out that food, uh, but two also from the, the amount of resources that we're in, uh, inputting into whatever that, um, that substance is gonna be. So we can think of it in terms of the, the livestock. Different livestock are gonna require different amounts of water. They're gonna require different amounts of feed. They're gonna require different amounts of land. And then we also have to consider the, the ethical considerations of um, consuming uh, meat and then just using animal products in general. And then in addition to the, um, the animals, there's going to be similar, uh, similar, thing, similar considerations for the, the different crops, because they're also going to have different requirements in terms of the, the, um, the amount of water they're going to need. And depending on what location that you live in, you're going to have different, um, different availability of water. So you may not be able to grow certain crops in certain locations, um, or it's just going to be extremely unreasonable to do so. You may have to, like, like if you want to grow cotton in an extremely dry place, you're obviously going to have to add a whole bunch of water compared to um, tomato, at least relative to the, the amount that you're going to be harvesting at the end. Um, so with the, the, the consumption of the, the different... Um, plants and food, we need to think about what resources we're using to, to consume them um, and sort of what they're, they're requiring in terms of the, the, the water, the land. Um, and similarly with seafood, we wanna think about the, the same thing currently. Um, seafood provides about 15% of the, the animal protein um, in human diets. Um, but globally, the, the, hum, uh, the, the fish populations are decreasing um, pretty quickly. And the, the reason for this is because we're simply over harvesting and it's just not a sustainable practice. So we talked about it a little bit in one of the, the previous chapters. Um, 
just the, the destruction of the, the marine ecosystems. We have the, the coral reefs just through ocean acidification um, and then just different different stresses on it that are ultimately killing it, um, like the, the cyanide and the, the, um, the dynamite fishing practices, um, the, the, the troweling where they just drag the, the giant net across the bottom and just pretty much scoop up everything that's there and then just destroy that entire environment. Um, so with the, the seafood, uh, if we wanna make sure that this is a, a sustainable practice going forward, there definitely does have to be um, some sort of conservative uh, conservation effort to make it a much more sustainable practice because those populations are decreasing um, very, very rapidly. Uh, but with seafood, one thing too to mention is um, seafood more than a lot of the other uh, types of meat have the ability to bioaccumulate. And then with this, we're looking at things like heavy metals and just other toxins that are gonna be in those, um, in that water. And it's gonna have the ability to bioaccumulate, which is essentially just build up in those organisms over time. So this is just showing the, the same fish just as they grow up over time. They're, they're swimming in some um, water that has some contaminant in it, just whatever it could be, some uh, pesticide, some metal, um, whatever it's gonna be. And you can see as they grow, since they're exposed to that, that contaminant in the, the water the entire time, their entire lives, the contaminant in it is just gonna bioaccumulate. It's just gonna build up over time. Because with the, the, the chemicals, the substances that can actually undergo these processes, um, they're just gonna stay in the, the, the body of these different organisms. Whereas other chemicals based on their properties are gonna be water soluble. They're essentially just gonna be excreted in the waste. Uh, but these chemicals are going to be stored in the, the fat of the, the organisms. Um, so as they, as they age, they're just exposed to that chemical more and more. It just builds up more and more. Um, but then what we also see is biomagnification. And now this is looking at how those chemicals build in the, the substance, in the, the organisms throughout the different trophic levels. So up the, the food chain. Um, and if you think about it, we've got plankton or whatever, the, the very, very small sort of phyto organisms, microorganisms, maybe, um, whatever the, the basis of this food system is going to be, is just going to be kind of floating around in that water. They're going to be exposed to those chemicals, but they're going to be very small organisms. They're only going to have a small amount of those chemicals in them. But then these fish are going to eat a whole bunch of them. So they're also going to gain those chemicals while also just swimming around in that water. So they're going to have a higher concentration. And now these seals are gonna eat those fish. So in addition to just swimming around the water, it's gonna get the, the chemical from everything else, lower in the, the food chain essentially. And then we see the same thing even more with the, the polar bear. So the reason we're calling it biomagnification is because we're essentially seeing the, the concentration of the, uh, the, the contaminant. We're seeing it magnify, we're seeing it increase as we go up the, the, the food chain. So that's why often you may have heard, um, at least depending on where you're getting your, uh, your seafood from, um, there are sort of recommendations on how often you eat seafood or at least what types of seafood you eat um, because you can expose yourself to um, some of these different uh, chemicals, some of these different contaminants, depending on exactly what you're eating. Um, for example, back... Uh, in New York, where I'm from, the, the Hudson River, I've mentioned General Electric dumped a whole bunch of PCBs um, in the, the Hudson River, and those are a contaminant that doesn't break down. So those are a contaminant that would bioaccumulate, would biomagnify. Um, so you can't eat the, the fish that are in the, the Hudson River just because they're going to contain those chemicals that are going to be harmful. And then if you eat those fish, they contain the chemicals. They're then just going to get into your body that way. Uh, and then in addition to... Um, sort of the, the fishing practices, there's something known as aquaculture, which is a little bit different. It's sort of just a, a fish farm almost. Um, and then these are good because they help maintain the, the fish population uh, and they help provide that, that nutrition source for people. They provide that, um, that dietary staple for a lot of people. Um, but they're gonna be negative because they can destroy the, the local ecosystem just in terms of um, intro, like setting up where they're gonna live a lot of times in, uh, Eastern Asia, the, the mangrove trees 
which are just sort of the, the trees that are along the, the coastline, which are very important for that ecosystem. A lot of times they get removed um, for, for shrimp farms and things like that. Um, and then also they're gonna hurt the environment just because now we're gonna be introducing a whole bunch of fish to one localized area. Um, so those fish are just gonna be excreting waste constantly. That's gonna pollute that, pollute that area locally. Um, but also those fish are gonna need to eat um, so they're going to be fed just the, the, the fish feed that whoever's running that place gives them. And then with that fish feed, there's actually been a little bit of evidence that the, the fish feed itself contains some contaminants. So then just adding that to the water is further polluting that environment. Uh, so with the, the uh, seafood, just like with the, the other uh, sources of food, we have to think about how we can do this in a more sustainable, uh, sort of a, a more sustainable way. Uh, but going back to the, um, the, the agriculture, thinking about the, the different crops, the, the basis of that is just going to be the, the ground itself. It's going to be the, the soil. But with the, the current techniques we use um, for farming, for agriculture, uh, we're typically seeing a, a depletion of that soil. We're seeing the, the quality of it decrease. Um, and we'll go into a little bit as why that's occurring. But before we do, we can just see some of the, the different components of soil. Um, so some things you may not really consider are these last couple. So fauna and flora, just referring to the, the different types of organisms that may be present there. So flora is just plants. Fauna is just going to be uh, any other type of organism, so even microorganisms. Um, and that's mostly what we're going to be thinking about in terms of uh, soil. But you can even think about uh, worms kind of wiggling through there, too. Um, and then with soil, you're probably thinking about the, the dirt itself, but just remember there is gonna be moisture in there. So we are gonna have water. That's why sometimes you're gonna have uh, mud versus just very dry uh, sort of sand. Uh, and then we'll also have air mixed in there too. So that's gonna be important for the, the different organisms, the different plants in there, they're gonna need oxygen, um, but it's also just gonna allow for, uh, for water to move through and for other things to just move through as well. And then these averages here, um, they are just gonna be sort of rough averages. So depending on where you are, you could have extremely, extremely um, wet conditions. So you may even have greater than 30%. Um, or in some, uh, some places like the, the desert, the, the soil moisture, it's gonna be extremely, extremely low. Um, but these are just kind of general averages, a ballpark range for those different, um, different pieces. Uh, but depending on the exact sort of ratio of those different pieces, we can see we're going to have different types of soil. Again, you can see what they actually look like over here. Um, and then depending on what type of soil we have, it's going to give it different characteristics. It's going to give it a different, um, different characteristics, just different ability to grow crops. Um, and that's why we're going to see some areas are going to be very fertile in terms of their ability to um, have very impressive uh, yields for the, the crops that are being grown. And then other places like the, the desert, you're not going to be really able to establish much, um, much in that environment. And then with the soil, just a couple of things, um, just a couple of the, the main things it does. So with the, the water, um, the, the soil itself helps protect in terms of the, the flood protection. So it helps slow down the, the movement of that water. Um, but it also helps purify it a little bit. The, the different organisms living in there can help remove those contaminants. Um, so as so can the, the, the plants that are actually growing in there. So sometimes the, the roots can take up the, the different um, contaminants. Uh, similarly, the, the soil, different pockets of it can kind of store some of the, the carbon dioxide that's being produced can kind of offset some of the, the global warming. Um, and then of course, we've talked about the, the um, food production. So it serves as the, the basis for those crops. Um, and then also just the, the matter, matter cycling. So this is talking about sort of the, the decomposition of organisms and recycling those nutrients. That process is almost always gonna occur in the, the soil. Um, you could have it occur uh, like in a tree or something like that, but typically you're gonna see whatever those organisms are, you're gonna see them fall to the ground, uh, whether it's like a leaf or something like that, and then break down in the soil, uh, recycle that way. 
And then remember, uh, it is a, an ecosystem in itself, so we are going to have different organisms living in there. Of course, we'll have the, the plant systems and things like that, but we'll also see microorganisms. Um, often we'll see microorganisms on the roots that actually help fix the, the nitrogen so it's in a, a usable form for the plants. Uh, but then we'll also see different insects and things like that in the, the, uh, the soil as well. Um, and then with the, the soil, we do have different layers to it. Um, typically, we're focused just mostly on the, the top because that's where we're going to see most of the so the, the biological action. That's where we're going to see most of the, the different organisms. That's where the, the plants are going to be located. Um, so the, the top, the, the, the very um, top layer is going to be the, the O horizon. And you can think of O oh, just in terms of organic, because that's going to be where most of the, most of the, the organic matter is going to be located. Um, and then below that, we have what's actually is the, the topsoil. Um, and that'll be where the, the roots are typically sort of the, the most established. Um, and that's going to be why it's sort of the, the most important for that food production. That's going to be where the, the roots are sort of set up in terms of gaining those nutrients, gaining the, um, the, the water it needs. Uh, and that's why the, the deserts. Are going to be one of the the most difficult plates uh, places for to plants or for plants to survive, um, just because of those top layers that provide those important nutrients, those important um, uh, supplies the, the plant needs for growth and survival. Those layers are going to be um, very very bare, very very minimal in the the desert environment, um, and that's going to be mostly due to just erosion. Uh, so we'll see erosion. I think it's on the next one. Yeah, um, it's going to be due to to wind and water essentially. Um, but in some cases, we'll also see chemical degradation of the, the soil, which is going to make it inhospitable. And that's going to occur when, um, if we wind up with too much salt or just in some cases, we may just have uh, other, other chemicals there that are going to make it a uh, not favorable environment. Uh, but like I said, with erosion, we're thinking about mostly wind and water. Those are going to be our two main um, causes of erosion. And with this, it is a, a natural process. It helps move around. Um, the, the different products of weathering. Um, so in that way, it can either lead to, to soil formation if we're bringing in new substances to kind of um, to form that soil, or if we're removing them, now we're obviously going to be losing that soil. Um, but when we're thinking about it in terms of the, the removal process, uh, wind, we can kind of just think about if we've got loose soil on top, the, the wind's going to be able to come along and just kind of scatter it that way. Uh, so we're going to lose the, the soil uh, in that process. And then in the, the terms of water, what we're mostly thinking about is precipitation, so rain and then melting snow as well. When that precipitation runs off the soil, goes to somewhere new, it's going to take some of that soil with it. Um, and this is currently an issue in um, quite a few places. Uh, I think Iowa is the, the one that's mentioned in the, the textbook. Um, and then Iowa as well, we're seeing the, the A horizon just is getting, um, in addition to the, the erosion, uh, I believe it's also just becoming less nutrient dense um, just because the, the practices they're, they're using aren't um, extremely sustainable. And then with agriculture, we're thinking about the, the production of food in order to, to feed humans. And this is gonna, this is going to factor in um, that soil quality, so where we're actually growing it, which is then going to factor in the, the weather, um, as well as just the, the ability to actually take care of those crops and harvest them. Because um, even if the, the soil is great, if the, the weather is fantastic, if I'm working by myself on an extremely large farm, I'm not going to be able to, to take care of everything by myself. Um, so it needs to have that, the ability for, for somebody to at least sort of care for it and then harvest those crops. Um, but we're going to be thinking about irrigation, the, the use of fertilizers, and then pesticides as well in that process. Um, and then with the, the water uses, water usage, um, agriculture is currently using about two thirds of the, the fresh water that's available. Um, and then this process is going to be dependent on a couple of different things. So it's not always going to be sort of uniform throughout. And then it looks like I didn't finish the, the third uh, point there. Uh, but it's going to be influenced by how much water is actually available in that region. And then also the, the ability to spend on different types of irrigation systems are going to influence this as well. So a lot of times the, the cheaper 
irrigation systems are actually going to wind up using more water just because they're going to be less, less selective. So they kind of just spray a bunch of water everywhere. Whereas the, the more, uh, more expensive irrigation systems, what they're going to be able to do is set it up so that they're essentially just spraying the, the base of the crop. They're spraying, spraying the um, sort of just the, the roots almost. Um, and that's going to help with water loss because if you have the water on the leaves, a lot of it's just going to evaporate. Um, but if you can get it down into the, uh, the ground, you'll see less of that evaporation. So it's just going to be a sort of a more economic use of that water. Um, and then currently the, whoops, the, the third thing here should just say, and I'm sure people are aware, water availability is starting to um, become more and more of a, an increasing concern. Um, so for example, I lived in Utah for the past couple of years, um, and then they did have different restrictions depending on which part of Utah you were living in. They did sometimes have different restrictions on um, water usage. So uh, in terms of watering your lawn and different things like that, um, they did have different restrictions on what you were actually able to do and for how long you were able to do it and when you were able to do it, things like that. Um, but in addition to the, the just the, the usage of water, we should also think about how we're using it. Um, so spraying water at different times of days can have different um, effects. If you spray it in the, the middle of the day when it's super hot, that water is going to evaporate pretty quickly. But if you spray the, the water at night when it's um, dark out, when it's not as hot, the, the water is going to stick around longer. It's more likely to be absorbed by the plant. It's more likely to be used rather than just kind of escape through the, the atmosphere. Um, so in addition to the, the systems, just thinking about how we use the, the water is also going to be an important, um, important step. And then um, with this, the, this irrigation can also often cause two problems. Um, the first one's gonna be water logging. And essentially what that is, is just uh, adding way too much water. It's gonna essentially sort of clog up the, the soil. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna prevent the, the roots, it's gonna prevent that plant from getting enough oxygen. Um, so it's not gonna be able to uh, thrive or survive that in that sense. And then also with the, the irrigation systems, a lot of times these irrigation systems are going to contain a, um, a small amount of different, different salts. And then salts are just a, a specific type of chemical. So they're going to be an ionic compound. Um, but with these salts, what they're going to do is they're going to travel with the water. They're going to land on the, the soil. And then the, the, the water is eventually going to evaporate or it's going to get taken up by the, the plant. But the salt, some of it's just going to remain on that soil. And then over time, we're going to build more and more of it up. And we're going to kind of have a sort of a, a, a film. We're going to have sort of a crust of soil on the top there. And then um, that can prevent resources from getting to the plant. But also just the, the high salt concentration is going to make it an inhospitable environment for those plants. Um, so that's why there's going to be a couple of different issues with irrigation sometimes and something that the, the farmers have to keep an eye on. Um, because if you have the, the salt concentrations build up too much, what you can do is just sort of rinse it off. It's just going to, if you come in with um, like a hose or something, spray it, you can just rinse that water off. But now what you're doing is just pushing that down the road. That salt's just going to go somewhere else and it's still going to be an environmental issue. It's just not your environmental issue anymore, basically. You're just kind of pushing it down, pushing it out of sight, out of mind. Um, but it's still going to be salt in the environment, which isn't going to be great for those plants. Um, so that's why sometimes there's the, um, the concern with salting roads during the winter. Um, it does have the, the benefit of making the, the road safer. So it gives us protection in that sense. Um, but it does have a, a negative consequence on the environment. So we often have to balance kind of those two, those two pieces. And then the, the use of fertilizer, um, this like pesticides is going to be kind of a, a double-edged sword because in one sense, it's going to be beneficial because it's going to help give the, the plants the, the necessary nutrients. So a lot of the, the phosphorus or nitrogen um, can come from these fertilizers. Uh, but they're going to be negative in the sense that if we over-fertilize, those substances are going to get... Um, somewhere else, they're going to get to a non-target area, a non-target organism, and they can have negative effects. Uh, so nitrates, for example, are in fertilizers. Um, 
And then those can have negative effects on kids. So if they, if we over fertilize those nitrates are just going to remain in the soil until they get washed somewhere else until water comes along and brings them somewhere else. Um, and that groundwater can eventually become drinking water. Um, so if those get to a, a certain concentration, we can start to see negative effects, especially in children um, who are typically more susceptible to um, all contaminants just because they're, they're still developing, but also simply just because they're smaller. Um, so they're sort of just the, the same amount of a substance is just going to have a relatively larger effect. Um, and then in addition to that, just the, the production of fertilizer is going to be a very intensive uh, process in terms of the amount of energy it uses. Um, so that's going to be a, an environmental consequence that also uh, needs to be factored into their, to their use. Uh, but in, uh, there are alternatives to, to fertilizers. Um, so you can use um, all organic materials. So things like manure can kind of provide some of those same um, benefits without some of the, the consequences, or at least as many of the, the consequences. You can still have some of the, the runoff um, occur there. But one thing you can also do is um, protect the, the soil just in general. One um, ways by using legumes, so or yeah, legumes, so just beans, um, because those are gonna have what are known as um, nitrogen fixing bacteria on the roots. So those are gonna help keep the, the, the nitrogen uh, levels adequate in that soil. It's gonna promote the, the plant growth there. Um, rather than if you just have the, the same crop in there over time, what you can see is the, the nitrogen level is just gonna decrease. You're gonna see the, the crops not be able to grow eventually. Um, or you can do what's known as cover cropping, um, which is essentially just planting a uh, planting something on the, the ground that you're not going to harvest, but it's just there to protect the soil. So it's going to help prevent uh, erosion. Um, it's going to keep the, the nutrients in that area. Um, it's also going to help keep weeds from being able to establish because the, the, the cover crop is already going to be sort of set up there. It's already going to be um, established. Um, and then all of that's just building towards a, uh, a more healthy uh, soil environment. And then pesticides is going to get its own video because, uh, like I said, that was sort of the, the area of my research um, when I was in grad school. And I think it's a very important just topic in general. So we'll focus on that one a little bit um, just on its own in the, the second video. Uh, but one of the, the last things we're going to look at in this chapter is genetically modified organisms. Um, and what these are just going to be sort of exactly what it sounds like. We're going to be changing the, the genes of these organisms just to give them some sort of uh, more desirable um, characteristic. So with plants, we can often think about that as in terms of their ability to become more resistant to different environmental factors. Um, so droughts or frost, um, different diseases, uh, poorer soil conditions. And then in animals, uh, things like pigs, they've developed uh, pigs to produce omega-3 fatty acids that can help protect your heart. Uh, different animals to produce uh, pharmaceuticals like insulin. I think that's also pigs, but I could be wrong. Um, but then just food sources in general, there's different uh, genetically modified organisms just to grow faster, to grow larger, um, to grow on less food. And then all of these are hopefully gonna be done in a way that's going to help supply food to more people, help improve the, the food security um, overall across the, the globe. And then this is going to be, in general, uh, you can kind of equate it simplistic, uh, simplistically to just cross-breeding plants. So something that was done um, a long, long time ago. So if you think about just to, to biology, you probably did the, um, the, what is it, the Punnett squares. Um, so it's kind of similar to that where we're, we're picking certain aspects, but it's going to be a more scientific, a more sort of um, controlled uh, approach. But with it, there are potential consequences of it. So you may have heard people being um, anti-GMOs. Um, and there certainly are some valid, um, valid concerns. Um, so it is sort of a, a new, newer science in some senses. So it could have some unknown consequences, like pretty much everything. Um, one thing people are concerned about is kind of the, the biodiversity in that area. If you have one um, one crop that's got some advantage, so whatever this genetically modified crop is, if it's got some advantage, it may outcompete 
the other species in that environment. And you may just wind up with sort of a, a monopoly. You may just wind up with that one species in that location. In a similar sense, you can wind up with a, a super weed if you have cross pollination occur that you didn't really intend for. Um, and then just in terms of the, the consumer effects, um, sometimes mixing these, uh, these genes can sort of mix the, the different allergies. So if you mix um, one crop with another, if somebody's allergic to the, the crop you mix it with, there may be um, some sort of allergic response associated with that. Um, so there are a few sort of issues with genetically modified organisms, but in general, I think the, the, the benefits greatly outweigh the, the, the potential risks. Because um, at least from what I've seen, the, the risks are mostly just potential. Um, I think the, the biggest one is kind of that biodiversity one. I would be most concerned about that one um, more than the, the allergy ones. Um, but maybe there's new data to kind of, uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, but I think the, the benefits are the, the stronger side of this argument, just because they are going to provide more food. They can provide uh, more nutritious food. Um, and in some cases, they can actually reduce the amount of uh, pesticides we're going to need to spray. Because in some cases, they can sort of modify them to produce their own pesticide. So we're not going to have to just uh, sort of spray them all over the place. They're already going to naturally be there. <clears throat> and then with these as well, uh, they can grow them so that they, or they can uh, modify them so that they're going to be able to grow in different environments. So that's going to be environments where they may be, we may not have to, to clear as much space. We may not have to use as much water. Um, so it's going to have economic and environmental benefits too. Um, so there are pros and cons to each. I think the, the pros, like I said, are slightly stronger, um, but I can certainly see the, the argument for both. Uh, but with genetically modified organisms, one definitely big sort of category or often mentioned group is what's known as Roundup Ready crops. And Roundup is just a, a product. You can buy it at a lot of different um, like agriculture stores and stuff like that. Um, but it's just a pesticide. And then they're called Roundup Ready crops because these are a group of genetically modified organisms that are chemically resistant to this crop. And the, the reason they're um, chem chemically resistant is because the, the, the Roundup is then used to just kind of spray it all over. And those Roundup Ready crops are gonna be completely fine, but the, the weeds and other stuff that you're trying to kill are then gonna become, um, are then just gonna ho hopefully die. Um, but the, the issue with this is, if you look, you can see just the, the overall use of uh, glyphosate, which is just the, the active ingredient in Roundup. Um, so Roundup has glyphosate and then it just has a couple other things mixed into it, but this is the, the thing that's um, like doing the work. Um, we can see the, the concentrations increasing over time. And the, the reason for that, or at least the, the suspected reason for that is because as they spray this Roundup, they're starting to see um, genetic resistance in those pests. Um, because when you spray that crop, you're going to kill most of the, the pests, but there may be a few that are going to be um, just naturally resistant to it. And now those ones that survived, we're going to see kind of similar to the, the adaptations we talked about in previous chapters. Now we're going to see that trait get promoted. We're going to see it advance into the, the next generation. And now we're going to see more of those are going to be resistant. So we're going to have to spray a higher level of this uh, this uh, compound, we're gonna have to spray even more of it in order to kill them. And that's what we're just seeing here. That's why we're starting to see the, the, um, the amount spray rise over time because the amount that's needed to be used is just increasing because the, the, the whatever the, the pests are, are just building up a tolerance to it essentially. Um, and then in addition to um, thinking about how we can kind of use pesticides better, that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit in the, the pesticide video. Um, so that will cover a little bit of this in, integrated pest management. Um, but in terms of sustainable farming, farming, what we can also think of instead of just focusing on sort of the, the pests, we can focus on the, the soil. 
because like we said, this is going to be the, the basis for all agriculture. This is going to be what these plants are growing from. Um, and we can see it here. This is going to be known as um, contour plowing. And this is just going to be when you're um, just on a hill or something like that, when you're going to have the, the rows run horizontal rather than vertical, because what this is going to allow is the, the runoff from water is going to be slowed down because now we have these flat levels and it'll still run off eventually from this one to the next uh, and so on. But instead of just having that even surface running down at an angle, now that we have the sort of the steps, we're going to see that slow down. So we're going to see the erosion slow down as well. Um, so that's going to help protect the, the soil in that way. Um, and then another process, what you'll often see, um, and sometimes you may even see it mixed in with contour plowing, is you'll see that um, you'll have different strips of different crops. So you'll see one substance or one plant is going to be uh, on this row. You'll have a second one here, and then you'll just kind of alternate. You may even have more than that, but you'll just kind of alternate. And the, the reason for that is because then you're going to harvest those crops at different times. Uh, so when you harvest them, you're going to have that area be bare. So you're just going to have that soil be exposed. It's going to be more susceptible to erosion. But now that we have the, the other areas still filled in, it's kind of protecting that one a little bit more. So then when we go to harvest the next one, we already have this one kind of built up a little bit again. And it kind of just gives the, the overall area a little bit more protection. Um, and then terracing just in general is just shaping the, the land to kind of prevent that erosion by being able to um, retain moisture, retain that water, or just retain that soil. So it's kind of just shaping it in order to prevent that runoff from occurring, uh, to, try to, to, to try to just um, slow down that erosion. And then in addition to kind of the, the sustainable farming, which again, I'll talk about more in the, the second video, um, one thing that can also be done is just buying local. So I'm sure you've heard this a bunch. Um, you may go to the, the farmer's market yourself, um, but for a couple of different reasons, that's going to help um, help prevent the, uh, help protect the environment, help pro promote the ec uh, economy of that area as well, um, because you're going to be supporting those local farms, those local um, farmers, as well as the, the jobs that they, um, like the, the jobs that they have on those farms, whoever's working with them. Um, there's going to be less environmental impact just from the, the shipping. So if you think about it, if you're buying those um, fruits and vegetables, the, the meat even maybe from a, a local farm, it's not having to be shipped a great distance. So we're not going to have to be burning those fossil fuels in order to get it from one um, location to another. Um, and then also with the, the small farms, they're not necessarily going to be using sustainable practices. Um, but a lot of times it's going to be more likely that they're going to be using those sustainable practices just because they're going to have a smaller scale. So it's going to be easier for them, whereas the, the factory farms are going to be much more large, um, much more focused on just simply increasing the, the profits. So that's why they're not going to be using some uh, as many of those sustainable practices. Or at least they're likely not to. And then, like I said, in addition to this, we will just have the, the video on the, the pesticides, um, just kind of focusing on that area.